Welcome to this Cody Connects webinar. In Bezo, Connecting the World Through Asset-Based Community Development was a webinar session hosted live on Thursday, October the 11th, 2018. Our Indigenous Women in Community Leadership graduates, Michelle and Hallie, had an opportunity to attend the Inviso Conference in South Africa in February of 2018. Inviso means a gathering in the Zudu language, and the conference itself brought people from all over the globe to share their experiences and their involvement in ABCD, and also to share their understanding of ABCD as it applies to them both locally and globally. We will now join the session in progress, in which Sadi is explaining the context of the Inviso Conference. Sadi is the former Chief Director of Sustainable Livelihood with the Department of Social Development for the Government of South Africa. She is a member of the Cody International Institute's advisory body and a graduate of the Cody's Asset Base and Citizen-Led Development and the Livelihood and Market Certificates. Sadi has a, a long-standing relationship with the Cody and is a passionate ABCD practitioner. Currently, she is the 2018 Cody Chair in Social Justice at St. of X. A Zulu word, which means a gathering, a gathering that is called by traditional leaders. So to give it a South African feel, we call it the Inviso. And, um, and also to give it an African feel, a South African feel specifically, we had to start with the national anthem. But as the conference went by, we had to give it an Africa feel as well as a global feel, because it was involving people from all over the continent and all over the globe. So uh, that's what we did. I was work, was co uh, facilitating with uh, Dee from Australia, and I'm telling you, I think we are branches of the same tree because we clicked at the very, very first day that we met, we clicked. And um, to put that conference together and to make sure that everybody is participating, we had to make it work. We had to make it work. There was drumming in the morning, there was singing, and uh, the popular song, which was the Inviso song, it's uh, <laughs> on your mark to get set, we are ready for ABCD. That was the national anthem for the Inviso. We had very, very good uh, sessions, drumming, we had circles where we were actually exchanging lessons. And what I really liked about the, 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 the circles is because in terms of our own African uh, philosophy, you know, sitting in a circle is what we really, what we really honor because it, we share the energy and it is actually an African way of doing things. And I think even with the uh, First Nations of Canada, that is also something that, you know, you also relate to very, very well. So um, we were managing those parallel sessions and uh, in, the, in the process I was also presenting, because I was presenting also sharing a story of my my, my, my uh, experience and how I grew up and how that actually is based on the ABCD principles. The focus was on ABCD in my blood. Okay. So, um, Hallie and I wondered, um, well, first of all, we messaged each other and said, oh my goodness, I got picked to go to Africa and I, I heard you did too. Um, so I'll let Hallie talk about her story about it, but um, we both met up in uh, Toronto at the airport. I was wandering around going, where are you? And she was texting me, I'm in this little restaurant. So I found her and we were both like, I've never been out of the country before. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, me neither. And I was like, okay, this is going to be interesting. And um, international travel is, is quite uh, intensive. You are on a really big plane that I, you know, only been on the little two row things. <laughs> this one had like three rows and two levels. And um, I remember saying to Hallie, I, I don't know what we're going to really talk about when we do our session in Africa. She says, we'll, we'll get it, we'll get it. I was like, okay. So the first day we were um, arriving at a place called, um, it's at Port Elizabeth, and we were right down by the ocean. So every day when you wake up and you walk down to this little, this conference place, it was stunning. Um, you saw the ocean and then you saw all of these people that are from around the world that are using ABCD. And so we were in these breakout sessions together and um, we were talking and leading these, 
talking circles and we were asking these questions like what what is ABCD to you and these people were talking with such passion and such um, emotion and drive and every night when we go back to our little uh, hut rooms we could be talking we'd be like wow you know, people are so inspired about ABCD I, I can't believe it and then um, Holly said one night she's like look at how many people from Cody are actually here and I was like, I know. And then the next day when we were standing, uh, I think it was Sad Sadi asked everybody, who's from Cody? And everybody stood up and there's probably about 150 people that had had a, had a link to Cody Institute for Learning ABCD. And after a while, Sally and I were both like, hey, we better have a really good presentation. Let's talk about this. So that night we were we were asking each other, you know, what is the what is the connection that we see for First Nations and Indigenous people? And, and we said, you know, we look at the good in people, that's assets. And then we said, you know, that's our medicine wheel. And so it was really cool because we did this whole um, medicine wheel picture, talked about all of the directions and, and what's in those directions. And then we talked about how we do that circular thinking. And they did it the same way in Africa, it was circular thinking. And it was such a... Um, a profound experience for me because even though we're continents apart, we all had the same kind of understanding of what it means to be a human being in this world and what it means to look at the assets around around where you are living and where that's centered. Um, for me, one of the things that really touched my heart was going to the Missionville site, which um, has over 65,000 people in a very small square radius and there's a there's a missionville kind of hub or center education center and health center there um, they had a clothing center um, where people could go and they could get food and they had a school there for, for children and some of the children that were attending school there kind of came with our group walking around with us and i remember saying to one of the little girls that you know what what do you like about school what is it that's uh, brings you here every day and she said well they feed me and I get to learn to read and um, she was just very inspiring and she she really touched my heart and um, I went back that night and really thought about you know we have poverty levels all through our countries and I talked about it in our YouTube video about how you know we can reach out from here and globally if we really care about people and um, that's what kind of I went away with from the conference so I'll let Hallie speak now. We hope. We hope. <laughs> These are video pictures and stuff that we took during the Yuzu conference. So this was different sessions that people could um, attend. Can you hear me? Hello. Hi, Hallie. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to, um, just adding on to Michelle's um, comments. When that evening, when we're sitting there deciding what to do our presentation on, um, it came almost naturally to us. And once we made that circle and we said, okay, the four directions, what the four directions mean, they mean to me from an Anishinaabek point of view living in Northern Ontario um, certain things and of course those teachings mean different things to different people across Canada um, but from my perspective what they what they mean to me on my limited experience and knowledge of our four um, directions in the medicine wheel that's what I brought forward to that presentation and that was just a little tiny bit of where I am at. And sometimes, um, if we look, um, if we look further, um, the layers and layers and complexities of that, I'll call it a tool that I use when I think about um, how I plan, how I um, look at my community, look at assets. Um, look at uh, development and, and trying to make sure that we encompass all those four directions in planning. If we think about mental, 
physical, spiritual, emotional. Thinking about those things, and not just those quadrants, but all the other ones that they need. Um, the circle of life, the, the floor, infancy, childhood, um, adulthood, elderhood, looking at the four, four seasons, all those things that we consider when we plan and when we look for those assets in our own community. And um, if it's okay, I'll just share a little bit of um, putting this into practice. The tools that I use um, when I think about the experiences I've had, the Inviso experience, learning from that, being there with Michelle and having that experience, and then bringing that forward to right now, when I think about, we talked about grandmother moons, right? Um, Michelle's passion is the, the moon teachings. So when I think about those things, I think about planning too. I think about what those moons mean to us as Indigenous people and how we can plan with those as well. For example, um, if we think about the harvest moon and what can we celebrate in the harvest moon, those kinds of things. When I think about um, specifically with health, um, Sometimes I get ideas, and those ideas are generated from those thoughts I get from the medicine wheel. And one idea I had was in relation to um, corn. And if we think about the corn from a community perspective, and we think about what that domain, we call it in my language, what it, how we could use that as a teaching tool for community. I'm sorry um, if I trigger anybody, but September 10th, for example, is uh, Suicide Awareness Day. And if I think about corn and asset-based thinking as a teaching tool, you see that the husk of the corn protects what's inside the corn. And you see that silk inside the corn that silk feeds all of those individual kernels. We have 13 moons, and there are 13 rows of corn in a corn. So, and each individual kernel in that corn is an individual on its own. So if I think about using the corn as a teaching tool, that husk, can be all those community organizations that surround and protect that one individual corn inside that entire corn. The silk could be all of us workers and how we work together to provide education, training, whatever need be to that community of corn. And then all of us as a community of 13 rows of corn and the whole entire corn need to remember that each of us is an individual and how do we come together to become that whole corn and the cusk and, and sorry the husk and the silk and all that thinking about maybe it's kind of silly but that's how I think about when I think about how can we incorporate our own culture our own moons into thinking about community and how can we use those things that we already know that animals, plants teach us so we can go back to that kind of um, thinking when it comes to A, B, C, D. Just an example. Um, I'm just amazed when I, when I reflect on this uh, experience in South Africa. I am ever so, ever so grateful I had the opportunity to go. And um, Michelle alluded to the fact that, um, and I did say in my video, our, our video, sorry, our YouTube, about the fact that I didn't, I didn't really realize how far reaching doing the iWICO program um, could be. And 
the amount of people have who have gone through the program, not just iWickle, but also the um, the other Cody programs, how big it actually is and how much of an opportunity it was to actually be in the iWickle program as well. I think I'll stop there because I can go on and on. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. I think um, what uh, also is very, very critical in terms of the application of ABCD, especially in, in South Africa and post the, the Inviso, is that we have realized that um, development is about people. It's not about things. And, and therefore, empowerment of people and creating that awareness in them that they are actually a critical asset that needs to be uh, adequately mobilized to be able to mobilize other assets. So, um, and, and we, we, we now have, uh, uh, in the process of engaging even our local government uh, in depth because most of the programs that are at community level are driven by local government. So, um, we, 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 we actually um, um, develop a strategy that says, you know, we've got to create awareness at the highest political level so that we can get support to, you know, to, to institutionalize asset-based community development within our own government programs. But as an individual, when you are in the community, you can try what you can do, but if it is not institutionalized within, uh, you know, our government programs, then it becomes very difficult because we, 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 we are not really uh, speaking the same uh, language. So um, we, we, we really have um, uh, taken this approach as a solution uh, to our country's problems, especially uh, in terms of uh, empowering and uh, ensuring that our African, South African uh, Africans, South African black people are linked to economic opportunities. They can only be able to access those if they are aware of themselves first as an asset and that there are assets around them. So um, ABCD in South Africa, it's now a, um, you know, it, it's very strong in our vocabulary. It's no longer a, a, a you know, just a, a word that you, are, you, know, you can just fling around, but it is something that we really are focusing on and we have established a very strong ABCD network post the, the Inviso. So we are meeting uh, almost every quarter so that it's, you know for us to give each other feedback in terms of where we are. You know from November when I leave here we will be uh, training uh, in, in, in our municipalities the public participation officials on ABCD so that they can start running with ABCD uh, in, in their own community. So it is um, our language, it is uh, we eat it, we, we, we sleep it, we dream it, we sing it. It is a national anthem. You know, um, on your mat, get set, we are ready for ABCD. Thank you. I think um, one of the things that we really appreciated as well during um, the conference was the youth that were there. Um, they actually had students from the local university um, coming and volunteering. So they were the ones that were running out and getting paper for people. And they got to actually sit in a lot of the discussions and the talks and the sharing with the different nations. And one um, session that I sat in, one of the youth stood up and said, you know, I live in this country and this is um, something that I'm really passionate about. He's like, I don't want to be dependent on the government. You know, my family who live, you know, about an hour away from here, he said, he said, we want to have our own system of, of development and, and giving. And he spoke with such passion and he said, you know, this group, he said, they're, I want to go and change the world listening to this. I, I, I really love that ABCD looks at me as a person and not just a number. And so we got into a, a discussion about education and how come it's so important that we look at where we come from and, and what we bring to the table. And he said, you know, I didn't think that I had anything to say here. I was going to be quiet. And he said, but you guys inspire me to bring my voice, bring my voice up and talk. So um, it was, like Callie said, a really magical experience. We felt really humbled to be able to be um, representatives of, 
of Canada, but also our nations. And um, I know from when we were when we were leaving, we both looked at each other and we were just like, "Wow, this is this has been an amazing trip." And it's it's embedded in my mind when people say, "You've been to Africa?" I'm like, "Yeah, I've been to South Africa," and I get to talk about it. And I have um, such gratitude for the sponsor that sponsored us anonymously. Um, we didn't, we don't know who gave us the opportunity to go on this trip, and um, I know that for me personally, it wouldn't have been something in my um, you know, span or plan and, and to be able to um, say, okay, yeah, I would love to go. And this is what I would talk about. And this is how I would bring my rec recognition of ABCD, how I use it in my community and looking at people's assets and seeing their strengths. Um, this is how I would share it. And to be, uh, to be told that you can go and you can tell people, you know, where you're from and, and share and learn from other countries even was, was phenomenal. So, I really thank Cody for, for allowing me to, to be a part of it, and I am ready for you to <laughs> Do you have any questions? Anybody online that has any questions? Is there a quiet bunch? <laughs> how much, uh, I mean, did your community uh, project, did you like a have it an open session where people have to attend? Yeah, we had a, an allotted time um, that we were able to do our sessions, and the sessions weren't that long. They were about 35, 40 minutes at the most. And you had to you had to do your presentation, and then there was somebody else that was ready to take the room to, to do their presentation. So you had to really speak fast and, and talk about um, kind of where you're using ABCD. And um, so I, I got to share about moon lodges and how I work in my community. Um, Hallie talked about, about her community and, and what she did. And then we had another uh, lady, Yuki, who talked about her project that she did in Zimbabwe. So it was really quick. We didn't realize that we were the ones that were gonna do all the speaking. We thought Pam, <laughs> our leader, was going to be talking. She's like, oh, it's you guys. So we're like, oh, okay. <laughs> but it was really, it was great. It turned out really good. I want to add something too. Yeah, there was multiple sessions going on. So you had to pick two when you weren't in a session which one you'd go to. So it was really hard. We, we kept saying, okay, you're going to that one, I'll go to this one. And, you put it, and then we come back and share what we learned. So. Michelle? Yeah. Remember the um, lightning rounds we did? Yeah, the lightning rounds. You can talk about that. We. Um, on a couple of the days, they had these uh, lightning rounds, they called them. And they had people um, stand up in the front of the um, podium and just say, I am going to be talking about whatever. And then he had these um, real quick breakout sessions, five minutes or whatever it was. So I think Michelle did one. I did a couple, actually. <laughs> We were nominated to go up, and it's kind of uh, uh, scary, but it's like, okay, let's go. So um, that was um, something interesting, too. We had to make a quick decision and prompt to think about something, and, and it was actually really good. Um, it was a good learning. It was a good to, to actually have the experience to just be, um, uh, to have the confidence to go up and stand up for that whole international group and say, yes, I'm here, I've raised my hand, I'm talking about um, maple syrup, I'm talking about whatever it is that I'd love to do when I think about ABC um, or ABCD. And so that was really um, stressful, but at the same time, there were lots of fun to see the people come into our little lightning groups to hear something outside of our actual session. So those are really, really um, fun to attend to as well. Yes, I forgot about that. <laughs> Eileen? So thanks so much, Holly and Michelle and Sadi, and Sadi in particular for being such a great host mm -hmm. um, to all of these uh, amazing women and men that were in South Africa. Um, a question for Holly and Michelle is really, well, actually two questions. What surprised you in terms of either commonalities or differences and the stories that you heard from others that were attending the, the Ambizo 
um, you know, given you know what you what you what you know of, of the experience of Indigenous peoples here, um, and and this you know the state of various communities, but particularly your own community. So, what what surprised you about what you heard from others? And I guess the second is, was there any specific tool that you took away from from the South Africa and Bezo? Um, you know, asset-based citizen-led development tool that you feel that you could immediately apply in your own community that, you know, was an additional tool for your tool belt, if you will, um, moving forward. Do you want me to go first, Hallie, or do you? Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think for for me, some commonality and surprise that kind of went, I went, oh, neat. It's, it's just like home. <laughs> Um, I, I saw or I heard or, or people shared with me what it was like in their home countries and there, there's a very beautiful woman who talked about the parenting issues and, and problems in her community. She lives in like a high village in, in uh, Morocco, I believe it was, and she, she's just talking about how you know, she was stressed out, her kids were acting up, she wasn't able to get them, you know, in uh, getting to school on time. And she said, you know, how do I get them motivated? And, and she actually did a breakout session where there was a whole bunch of people from different countries that, that were like, yes, we need to look at parenting and how do you put ABCD into parenting? And it, it didn't occur to me to look at ABCD from that perspective, but I was like, you guys are right. Why are we looking at assets in our children? Why are we why are we always pointing out the negative in our in our children, and why don't we work on their assets? So all the parents in that circle in that session for the 15 minutes that we did the lightning round, all gave suggestions on how to look at um, assets in children and how to bring that into your parenting. And then they said, no, if we do this, if we go back home, how can we how can we build that into our school system? Because maybe it's not really us as parents, maybe there's some negativity in the school system. So how do we improve the assets in the school system? So that was neat because I was like, you know, we're not all that far apart. And yes, country-wise we are in the, the distance, but we all have the same types of issues in our in our family life. And then um, a tool that I would bring back, we did the ABCD poster. I'm not sure if you guys seen it up there, but it had the Mbizu um, across it, and then they wanted us to put our mark on this poster so that they knew who we were. And they were, you know, this this one person said, you know, when I do my ABCD in the community, I I ask why not you? And it really hit me, right? Like I was sitting next to Mary Coyle, and I was like, whoa. And she said, yeah, really, like think about that. Why not you? Why why do we wait for somebody else to step forward and say, okay, I can do this. Um, for me, it was really something that I'll, I bring to the sessions that I do. And I say, like, you know, why not you? What What's stopping you? What are the issues? What are the, let's look at that. Okay, what are the assets? What can you bring to this? And so I I took that with me when I left Africa. I was like, why not? Why Why can't I do it? Let's, let's go. <laughs> I was really inspired when I got back. So it was, it was really good. Ali? All right, so the session that really hit um, home with me was the one by Sadie. Um, she was talking about um, the story about when she was young and her and her sister and how your parents used to um, sell things on the side of the road and um, to make a living and to, and to provide for your family. And it really made me think about um, that similarity that we have here, where, where um, I was told by an elder that years ago, people um, were referred to by their asset. For example, there was the fisherman. So, there was the person who had farm, um, like cattle or eggs, chicken, pigs. There, were, there was the people that did uh, potatoes. There's people who did certain certain types of 
skills or provided that um, food or something to the community. Somebody made nets. Somebody did, did all these different things. So that's how they were re referred to. So the story that she told about her childhood growing up and her, her, I believe it was your dad, um, how he was very, um, uh, finding all kinds of different ways to provide for his family. And that's how I thought that relates so strongly to me at home because there's so many people that have so many amazing assets. We have crafters, we have hunters, we have all these different people that have all those different kinds of skills. And they use those skills to provide for their families. And that was the thing that really struck with me that's saying, wow, you know, in South Africa, they have all these people have all these different types of skills and they're doing all those same kinds of ideas that we do here at home to provide for our family. We do it because we have to sometimes and to provide for our ourselves, for our children, make sure that they're fed, they're clothed. We learn those kinds of skills and then we share them with each other in our own communities. And that's where that really struck the similarity with me. I'm like, wow, you know, like maybe we've been doing ABCD all the, forever. We just never called it ABCD. So I was telling Michelle one evening, you know, and we're just giving it a name now, but we've been doing it forever. So that's the big light moment for me. And that's where I said, you know what? This is the medicine wheel. This is how we think. Um, so that's the, the tool I came home with. I, I brought and I came home with, but at the same time, I'm thinking about the concept about the uh, leaky bucket, you know, the ABC tools that we know already, those kinds of things. And if I apply the leaky bucket to actual real life uh, situations, like um, we think about all these skilled people that we train um, on our reserves and they leave. So that's the, those are the assets I see as leaky buckets too, is all those people who actually go to, uh, go to post-secondary school or have some kind of skill or have some kind of asset and we're not, for whatever reason, we're not allowing them to use all of those skills or assets that they have because of the job descriptions or, you know, things like that. And I understand that the reason for job descriptions, but those kind of things I think about Leaky Bucket, I think about our assets and our young people and how we can actually, if we can really use the, their their assets, their skills, and so that they, they don't leave and they stay and, you know, are able to share those assets that they have. So. I guess that's the the big thing I saw too was that 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 looking at leaky bucket. Okay, I think um, you know what what I actually appreciate a lot is the the leaky bucket tool and the capacity to which uh, we have been able to use it as a means to assist us to, you know, in terms of addressing the issue of unemployment, because we've got a very high level of unemployment, especially young people. Now, the leaky bucket is a decision-making tool that is assisting us to find opportunities and to, to, to teach uh, young people to be able to find opportunities, because, you know, uh, young people in South Africa, um, you know, the government with the pro poor policy has created that mindset that government will provide for everything. And therefore, people are just sitting and waiting for government. But then, you know, using the leaky bucket, it helps them to be able to, you know, to, you know for, for that mindset to change and for them to be able to see opportunities that, you know, um, so we, 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 we are trying to contextualize the, the, the tool to address uh, the, the, the challenges that we are facing. For example, you know, I actually 
uh, engaged the University of Pretoria, which is located in, in, a, in, a, in a township. And I engaged the dean, uh, who are, you know, the, the university is actually hosting cooperatives which are led by women and they are making, they are making school uniforms. But then I said to the dean, uh, there must be opportunities within this community, within this university. Let us use the leaky bucket to identify the, 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 the opportunities. So it was what goes in into the into the, the university. They are you know they are paying uh, you know, university fees and the money that comes from government at certain so what is this money used for? You know there's a restaurant there's this and then but now where are the opportunities? You know, so social entrepreneurs or social enterprise students and those that are doing commerce and whatever, they are then, you know, becoming aware that even within this institution, there are opportunities that we can that we can have. So we are actually using the leaky bucket in every space where we can uh, for us to be able to identify opportunities. But just lastly, uh, the story that uh, Hali is referring to, the essence of it is that it doesn't matter how bad a situation is. Out of every bad situation, there is something good that is coming out of it. That time we were, I mean, we are from a very, very um, turbulent uh, era where, you know, apartheid was terrible in South Africa and we had to, to leave. So we, we, we were using what we had. We were using our land. We were, you know, and as a family, we saw ourselves as resources for the family. You know, we were milking, we were, you know, there was no one was seen to be useless. My mother didn't have a secondary education, but because she worked for the German family, she brought the skills that helped us, you know, she was making gems and we were selling. So I'm trying to say to uh, whoever that I meet with that it doesn't matter. If, if you find yourself in a situation that is tough. It helps you to be able to think outside the box. So we must be able to think about the assets that we've got and how we can use those assets for us to be able to, you know, not only to survive, but to create livelihoods that are sustainable. Any other questions? Huh? I have a question, but I don't know how to phrase it. How did you come? You, I listen, but is it that you come from? We always say we come from poor. Did you come from poor, and your mom selling the jam got you to where you are today? Is that how that? How did you go from? You know, like you're you're teaching us this ABCD program. So how did you utilize it in your childhood and your youthful age now to be where you are today? Okay, um, how, how we used it, the, uh, you know, from my, my great-grandfather, you know, when, when Africans did not see land as, uh, you know, the, for them to buy land was like, no, 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 land belongs to God. It's a resource, so we cannot buy it. But then at that time, before the 1913 Land Act, uh, my great-grandfather bought land. And although in, in the process they were dispossessed of the land, but that did not discourage them not to go further and find another piece of land. So we are a family that has always lived on land. And then um, I think what was, what was very important, and what's very important in, in our family history is that uh, when you know um, they were coexisting with whites, and and the whites were actually you know uh, oppressing them, they were learning some of the things. So they drew lessons from from the whites that they were working for, because they then were sharecroppers. And as sharecroppers, they learned the skill of you know uh, how do you produce, how do you do that. And then when we were moved to the reserves, they then utilized that knowledge to start growing their own crops. So out of that bad situation, for them was the knowledge that they, they were able to draw from that relationship where they were sharecroppers, 
working on the, 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 the farms of, 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 of white, 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 white owners. So they brought that information back. So it, 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 it was a situation that helped us also, uh, like you are, you are asking whether you know, I'm coming from a poor background. It was not really that poor because uh, our parents drew lessons. When they were poor at that time, they learned from their oppressors and they took that knowledge in the reserves, they implemented that and they built their own schools because they realized that education is very important. So the school that I attended was built by my grandfather and our aunts were, you know, were taken to school to say, you must go and learn so that you can come and educate your own. So it was like, when I applied the ABCD principle, it was not a leaky bucket because they were taken to school and they said, you come back and come and teach your own because your grandfather has built a school. So there was a school and a church. And so it, those two assets were meant also to help us to be able to, you know, embrace the values that make us who we are today. So it, it, it's that kind of thing that if you are in a situation, that's why I'm saying out of every best situation, something good comes out of it. So you just don't have to say, because my grandfather was poor, I am also poor. You've got to say, no, no, uh, I'm going to get out of it because, you know, th 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 there's so much. There's so much. And now we are actually writing a storybook with my sister where we are taking our, the way, you know, our upbringing. We were not spoiled. We had, we had what we had. We were not very rich, but what we had, we were not spoiled. We were going to school on a donkey cart. Uh, but my father said, he had a car, but he said, that one is mine. I have worked for. Yours is this donkey cart that I have designed. Raining or storming, we are going to school on that donkey cart. Coming back home, we were going to the field to go and work. So, so that, that's how we grew up. Every morning after the milking, we take the, the can of milk to the roadside. The truck will come and collect the milk. So we knew that for every little thing that we, we have to, that, that we've got, we must work for. Which for me is a principle that I think if we carry, we'll be able to move as even as, you know, from whatever situation, we'll be able to get out of that situation. That's why our kids are so spoiled because we do everything for them. For them, yes. And they're like, all day long. My daughter, I was smacked her because she's downstairs and I'm upstairs. Can you get me water? <laughs> I flipped all the way up the stairs. Do you want water? Yeah. yeah. So I blame us as parents that yes. we give our, we enable our kids. We have 50 year olds still living with mom at home, not mine, but I'm just kind of putting it that way where people don't leave their home anymore and some parents are okay with that. They don't want the kids out to do anything. You know, I've got four boys and uh, I, I used the principle that my parents raised me with. Because my father used to say to us, uh, in the morning she would wake us up and say, you see that Jew, you see the morning Jew, when the sun rises, it disappears. All these things that I have, you don't even know how I amassed these things. So if I pass on, like that morning Jew, they will pass on. So the best inheritance that I'm giving you is education. And the same principle I applied to my kids to say, I am doing this for you, but you know, you don't know what's gonna happen after I pass on. Mm -hmm. But the morning too, when the sun rises, it fades away. So the same principle. Now I have acquired the skill of making ginger beer from my mom. And uh, June, now June this year, my son was getting married. After the wedding, they came to me, the four of them, they said, Ma, your ginger beer, everyone wants some more of that. So it means that there's an opportunity. You always tell us about economic opportunities and assets and whatever. That is an asset. So now we must find a way of making sure that we market this. Now, as I speak, the orders are just flowing in. They started themselves and they said, sign on it. It is your signature ginger beer. But now out of what I learned from my mother, 
Now, I have also taught, because I'm here, they are brewing it at home, and they are selling it. So it has become now a family business. Way to be creative. Yeah. <laughs> Hallie, do you have anything else to add? I'm not. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I um. <laughs> I just um. This summer, I was an interim manager at our clinic, <laughs> and um. One of the things that I focused on was looking at the assets of my team. So putting putting the things you learn um, in this IBICO program, uh, leadership, taking the things I learned from A, B, C, D, and actually applying them to when I was a manager to my team to say that, okay, you are hired for this certain job. Maybe it's a community health worker. And that's your job description. But what are the other things that I don't know about you that you have that can actually be put to work in this position? Um, and some people, they, they have surprising backgrounds we don't know about until we actually ask them and say, okay, so how can you use those tools to to better this position, to um, make different programming for our communities. Um, and we, we tend to work in silos sometimes. And that's what I was trying to get my community to, I should say my team members to look at, is to look at themselves and to reflect upon the skills that they have, the skills that they want to learn, and to know that I was there, I, and I would go to bat for them to say, you know what, um, this person has this hidden talent. You know, let's use it in a real world kind of situation. And and if we can, you know, then try to make sure that we use those skills that those people have. And Michelle knows I have a very, very um, lot of different interests and backgrounds in my life. And I bring so much of that into my work as well. I used to be an undertaker. I used to be a paramedic, you know. So all those different things and all my other interests. I love art and all these different things. I make syrup and, you know. So how do we incorporate those things that we love just as people as um, as well, if we think about assets, bringing those things we love in the community to have have our com community. Maybe there's somebody who wants to learn how to be an undertaker. Maybe there's somebody who wants to know about, oh, I used to be a paramedic. Oh, I heard you know how to make syrup. You know, those kind of things that I have. But as my job, I don't really share because, you know, it's not my job. But to have those actual assets somewhere on my tool belt too to say, you know what? We can do we can do maple syrup and you know that's good for the spirit because you're out there. You're tapping trees in the middle of winter in the middle of winter, spring. It's good for physical activity. It's good for your um emotional health. You sit out there, you can listen to the trees <laughs> You know, it's good for all of those four elements I talked about when we say the medicine wheel, emotional, spiritual, mental, physical. And as a nurse working in my community, that's my job to be a nurse. But I have these skills. I can make maple syrup. And you know what? How can I inspire someone to let's go get active and teach them how to make maple syrup. Yeah, you know, it's not part of my job description, but it's good for health promotion, it's good for education, illness prevention. SAP is the first medicine in the spring. So using all those different cultural things together into um, promoting me um, and I guess highlighting some of those assets I have that I bring to the table in a certain job 
description, if that makes any sense, you know. So that's what I was trying to draw out of my staff this summer, saying, you guys, you have all these different skills and talents. How can we use those and highlight those in our jobs while we're here this summer? And that's, um, it was something I was hoping would like be really, yeah, yeah, I have this skill, but it's really hard to draw that out from people, you know, because we're so used to saying, nah, I don't know what talent I have. So helping people to acknowledge those, helping people to draw them out and highlight them. And it makes me think about the spring. Um, we think about the 13 moons and what they mean to us. And in the spring, in May, the, the month is um, about the flowers blooming. And part of that teaching there is about ego versus pride. So part of that is saying, you know what? Yeah, be proud of those skills and talents that you have and try to manage that. Like, ego, okay, yeah, but be proud of those skills and talents that you have and don't be ashamed or scared to let them show when we think about those kinds of teachings that we learn from those grandmother moons. So another kind of um, bringing the two worlds together, I guess. When you think about our culture, our teachings, when you think about our Western ways of having job descriptions and all those kinds of things, how do we how do we marry those two? And when I went to the Iwiko, um, and then the Inviso, and then I actually went to a medicine conference, and then taking all of those different experiences and saying, how can I help my community? It's always been my thought. How can I come home and help my community to actually highlight and help them shine and help them to see all of their talents and skills and assets and, and all the different forms that there are and not um, just the one one thing, if that makes any sense. Awesome. <laughs> um, we'll just do a couple closing comments from us, and uh, I'll I'll go. I need to um, really say that in Bizu, um, when I learned I was going and I researched the word about gathering, for me that's the foundation of, of what I like to do and how I like to work with people. And um, I got to share this week the, the moon teachings that I, I know. And for me, um, looking at people's assets is what drives me. I love to see that spark in people and I love to see, um, you know, inspiration even from hardship or um, your story, your personal, your personal story. So, in Bizu for me was really amazing because even though people came from really diverse situations and there was a um, sometimes a lot of trauma, there was always hope, and it it really inspired me. And I knew I was in the right place at the right time. And you know, I want to thank Hallie and Pam for being my my roommates in in South Africa. It was very it was great. I got to see an elephant on my birthday. It was really amazing. And, um, you know, it's one of those lifetime memories that you're going to have forever. And, yeah. Thank you. Okay, my um, parting word, uh, uh, in particular for my family here, is uh, that there are certain words that we have to move from our development to a kind of poverty. Um, you know, the way we overemphasize the word poverty and telling people how poor they are, we actually are planting a seed where people do not see themselves as worthwhile. So the, the, the development language that we use is, is, is disempowering. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, you may not have, but you are not poor. Because you've got a mind, you've got a body, you've got a soul, you've got your head, you've got everything, you've got, you've got assets. You are richer than what you think. And in South Africa, there are so many people who make money 
out of going out and telling people that they are doing it for the poor. Uh, and yet they are not doing it for the poor, they are doing it for themselves. There's so much money that goes into, into departmental budgets and into budgets of NPOs in the name of helping the poor. But we are actually not helping the poor, we are making the poor get poorer. Because if the poor, those people that we term poor, can become empowered, you are losing your job. So for other people is to maintain their job by going out and making people feeling that they are poor so that they can be disempowered forever. Poverty disempowers. It is important that you must empower people because if you don't claim your power back, you will never get out of the situation in which you are. So uh, what I say, what I would like to say is go back when you go back to your communities, start applying ABCD in your own home. Do a skills audit in your own family. Do an interest audit in your own family. Because you might be a teacher, but actually what you are, what you, what your passion is not about teaching, it's about doing something else. So if you must start doing that in your circle of friends and you will be shocked how much you value the others are in your family and in a circle of, 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 of friends. And, and start applying. When you do the leaky bucket, start with the leaky bucket in your own home. And sit with your family, do an analysis. Do an asset mapping of your own uh, surroundings. You know, your house is an asset. Then the road that passes in front of your house is a phys some physical infrastructure. There is electricity. There are people. You've got family. You've got friends. So take that asset to those five critical assets. Associations, institutions, uh, human assets, social assets, financial assets. Do your own analysis and just find how actually rich you are. And then as a community, find a way of plugging those leaks. So uh, let's remove this word of, you know, the poorest of the poor. I, I, I hate that we do the passion, the poorest, because there's no one who is poor, you know, and there are different types of poverty. If you want, if you are poor in spirit, you might have as much money as you have, but then, you know, what are you going to do? So let us try to empower each other. Thank you. Thank you. Ali, do you have anything else to say? <laughs> I um so just to recap on some of the things I I other than the medicine meals we looked at all the four directions and we talked about the thirteen grandmother moves I mentioned a few of them. The other thing is the seven grandfather teachings and how we incorporate those into our decision making and the way that we live. Also the seven stages of life. So those kinds of things are are what I think of when I think of A, B, C, D as well. Because we, when I think about planning, Thinking about all of those different things, it's a lot to think about, a lot to consider, but just keeping in mind from a Anishinaabek point of view, my point of view from Mantun Island, um, Ojibwe, Potawami, Odawa, my teachings, very specifically, um, because we all have different um, stories and teachings behind all those different things. But, but when I talk to people about planning, when I talk to them about our, our community, about ABCD, I also think about these things. So, we talked about the seed. We have, um, we have issues and people coming out to events, to programming. Maybe one person might come, two people might come. So we had a discussion about um, we should be canceling programs if less than four people show up or less than five people, my staff were saying. 
So less than five people, you cancel one event. Yes, they said. Okay, but why? Why five? And I realized that uh, we have vans, and a lot of times people need rides. And, and seven passengers, so if they don't have enough people to fit a van, basically they cancel a program. But when I think about planting that seed, I think about that seed as the asset. And if that one person is making a commitment to come out to the program or come out to learn to to um to learn whatever it is that's going on in that event. That one person is that seed. And that one person likely has children or a partner. You know, so if we can plant that seed and we can nurture that one and then it's gonna grow. And it's going to ripple. It's going to turn to, you know, grow roots and have branches and all, all those things a tree or a plant does. And to me, that that when we talk about the the seed, and I think about A B C D. I think about how we, because I'm a nurse, so a lot of my thinking is all about that kind of health programming. If we're able to nurture that one seed, knowing that they branch off, and knowing that they have. Um, connections in the community and they start talking to somebody else that's the thing where I, I was really trying to emphasize to staff and to myself and to anybody I talk to about that kind of ripple effect that that seed is going to turn into something and to not give up on them still try and nurture that and when I think about my eyewitness I, I experience my project was on palliative care and I thought it was a very small little tiny project and I, I ended up um, making a poster for it I ended up going doing a presentation uh, at a First Nations gathering for palliative care I did a poster conference at a, a national um, palliative care conference so that's that little seed I thought was just like, oh, it's just a little palliative care thing, you know, I'll just go and do this. I don't know how big it's going to get. And you know, that experience, um, and it's still, it's still going right now. I am uh, still looking at doing presentations, um, going on to other conferences. So whatever project you're working on right now for your iBook experience, if it might seem a community small focus thing, you just never know where that is going to take you. And so, for us as alumni, we still feel that nurturing of Cody, and we still feel nurturing of the the um, being part of the online family and the Cody Connects. So we still have that, and I really do appreciate that. And that. Um, I'm here now to speak to you and to share that experience to let you know that, you know, it really, I don't think it's going to end after your program's done. There's so much more, there's so much uh, connection, there's so much, like our, our cohort, we all still communicate, we all still kind of meet up, meet up every now and again. So that's going to be something I believe is going to be a lifelong, life-changing experience for you as well. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I just want to say Leewin, Malawin, to our speakers, to Holly for joining us um, online, and for Michelle for coming and organizing this, and, and for Sadi for coming and speaking. Um, I think they have a lot of wise words for us. So. Thank you for watching this Cody Connects webinar. I do invite you to go over to the Cody International Institute's YouTube channel for our other webinar recordings. And also our Cody graduates are invited to log into Cody Connects to continue the conversations with their fellow graduates around the world. Thank you very much.